Thank you, David, for such a comprehensive and deep uh, presentation. I think you've touched most parts of the elephant. <laughs> uh, so as we normally do here, we're going to take three questions, and then uh, the word will return to you, and you answer them. Right? So I have one answer, one question here. Three people have raised their hands. So. Please identify yourself and make a concise question. Wait for the mic. Oh, and if it's in Portuguese, let me uh, put on. Yeah, yeah. You go first, and then, and then the young man. Hello, my name is Ari Handler. In English. He's uh, I am a party member of PSDB, <laughs> so I'm one of those Soviets, okay? Uh, th there has been a lot of talk about hard landing of the uh, Chinese economy two or three years ago, and I saw you didn't mention this issue. Is that not an issue anymore? It will be a soft landing of the Chinese economy? Thank you. OK, the second one. Uh, good evening. Uh, from what we learned here uh, today, on one, louder, hand, louder. on one hand, we have a, a country want, wanting to have uh, a more centralized power and uh, at the same time grow economically. Uh, what can we expect from Hong Kong uh, relation with the mainland? Third and last question of the first round. Uh, my name is Philip, Philip Yang. I work for an institute which is called URBEM and uh, does urban planning studies. So my first question is related to, I have two questions if, if, if I could. Uh, I have two questions. So my, the first one is about, uh, you mentioned urban transition, the urban transition in China. And you also mentioned the housing bubble. So my question is, is there a housing a deficit in China as a result of this urban transition? How are the, the low-income population coping with the need of uh, living in, in, in the big cities? The second is about the political system. You mentioned that uh, the, the Communist Party is hegemonic and the political system is centralized, no, no doubt about this. My question is whether you see the system as a meritocratic system as well or not. Thank you. Good. Uh, All right. Second round. Ba back to you, David. Um, let me just get your last question. Um, so uh, maybe I'll go in the order they were, they were asked. Um, I suppose, you know, you're right. Uh, three or f four years ago, Maybe more like five years ago, there was discussion about a possible hard landing in China. Oh, I know, it was after the stock market crash, right, of the summer of 2015. And then it crashed twice in three months. Um, even, even at that time, economists uh, would say that the stock market <coughs> bubble was not representative of the Chinese economy, and it shouldn't be seen as some harbinger of a uh, hard landing in the Chinese economy. So even at that time, the reports that I read suggested that uh, it was not, hard landing was not a possibility. So it's kind of a non-question. It wasn't soft versus hard. It just China's economy continued to stand uh, during that period. It's just the housing or sorry, the um, stock market bubble, which was heavily subsidized by the state, which is the way it stabilized, right? Xi Jinping's answer for everything, pour more money into it, right? If it's a stock market, I mean, he doesn't have a lot of confidence in markets. You know, he thinks markets can be manipulated, managed. And, and so if you take an industrial policy approach to stock markets, which is what they did that summer, uh, he wound up stabilizing it and they bought up Anyway, you, you know what happened. So the economy was never really in danger then, and it's not in danger now. That's why I intentionally put up the slide of the good news in the economy. But some of the structural problems <coughs> facing the economy are um, serious problems, 
there are serious problems if they want to uh, escape the middle income trap. If they don't want to escape the middle income trap, they can just keep on pouring concrete and, and uh, financing it through credit and hence their debt will continue to balloon. Now economists are beginning to, to warn that this is, the debt levels are of an uh, unsustainable nature, right? If you get close to 300% uh, where there's no collateral. This money's never coming back, right? Why? Because they don't really have banks in China. They have pass-through organizations that they call banks. <laughs> that the central government passes money through them to localities, to provinces, or to favored state-owned enterprises, or to projects. So the so-called banks simply loan the money. They don't do credit risk. They don't do feasibility studies. They're begin I'm told that they're, they are being told to begin to do so now. Finally, great. But, you know, this money, it's gone. It's never coming back. So that is a serious uh, problem, um, if, and they're aware of it, and they're trying to get control over that, as well as trying to get control over the money that's leaving the country, the trillion dollars a year. Um, okay, Hong Kong, you asked about Hong Kong. Well, uh, depends on the perspective. You know, if the perspective is um, Hong Kong autonomy under the one country, two systems uh, scheme, that was ag uh, agreed to between China and the UK, uh, then you have to conclude that the uh, one country, two systems is being eroded, steadily eroded uh, in Hong Kong. Um, it was being eroded before the umbrella revolution, so-called umbrella revolution, and it's been steadily eroded since, particularly in the areas of media, higher education, and the judiciary. So the trend lines in terms of Hong Kong autonomy running its own affairs, particularly in those three areas, media, higher education, judiciary, not good. Uh, the PRC is increasingly pressuring, manipulating, threatening those three sectors. Um, and they're doing some really, uh, you know, unprecedented things like kidnapping uh, business people uh, and, journal and publishers off the streets and out of the hotels of Hong Kong and taking them into mainland China where they just disappear. This has happened. Uh, so Disappear for good? Well, they haven't <laughs> reappeared yet. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's a pretty long-term disappearance. Um, uh, actually, Xi Jinping in his speech, he did um, say that China is now going to abolish the what they call the Shanghui system which is detention, indefinite detention without uh, acknowledgement that the person's being detained and having habeas corpus in effect. So that's progress. Anyway, Hong Kong um, is not going in a terribly, uh, from the perspective of Hong Kong and the perspective of Britain and the outside world, not going in a particularly good direction. But from the perspective of Beijing, it's not going in a good direction either because you've got, uh, you know, a lot of young people who are discontent. They don't believe in the motherland. They're not even sure. They really, last week they had a soccer match in Hong Kong. 70% of the stadium turned their back on the Chinese flag when the national anthem was being played to begin the match. Think about this that. Worse than the N NFL. That's worse than the Game NFL. <laughs> um, in fact, I met a Hong Kong journalist the uh, day before yesterday before flying down here, and he was going to write an article comparing the NFL <laughs> kneeling to the Hong Kong soccer match. But 70% of the stadium turned their back on the national anthem. That's pretty... Uh, so if you're Beijing, that's not encouraging. So Hong Kong is going this way from where Beijing wants it to go. The question is, can Beijing bring it to heel? Um, through pressure. We'll see. Uh, the other questions, um, quickly, Philip, uh, you ask about urban transition and is there a housing uh, shortage or deficit in China? Well, those are two different questions. The urban transition, they're very, they have very ambitious plans. Right now, China is about 40, about 50-50 urban rural or 40 urban, 60 rural. By 2025, they want the country to be 75% urban. Uh, in other words, they want to move a quarter of the population, which is what, 400,000 people, 
400 million people, excuse me, 400 million people, think about that, into urban centers uh, in the next seven years. That's a, and they have identified some. They're building a couple new huge cities um, south of, they're going to build a new capital, you know, south of Beijing, you know, like Brasilia. Um, and so that's ambitious. That's really ambitious to create an urban society. I think essentially what they're going to do is a lot of administrative restructuring so they will expand the circumference of the cities to absorb more rural dwellers, but the rural dwellers won't move. They'll just be reclassified <laughs> as urban dwellers. But the other part of your question, is there a housing deficit? No, there's an enormous housing surplus in China, um, except in the major cities where there's a housing deficit and hence the housing bubble, which permits the speculation. But you can travel across China and see what the ghost cities they're called, one after another, is take the train from Shanghai to Beijing next time you're in China. You go through Shandong, there's one unpopulated ghost city after another. You know, beautiful, big, new developments. No human beings in them. No cars parked, no dogs, no children playing, nothing. No humans. Um, so they've overbuilt. Why? You know, because of the credit that I mentioned. They just keep the credit flowing, pouring more concrete, keeps people employed, that's fixed asset investment. That's what they've been doing for 40 years, like a, like a drug addict. They can't break, until they break their fixed asset investment uh, habit, they're not going to get, get through the middle income trap. And uh, lastly, you ask, is the political system meritocratic? Yes, it is. Uh, and it may seem contradictory to you, but there is a very, it's a hegemonic Leninist system with meritocratic characteristics. They have taken it very seriously in the last, oh, I'd say, 10 years, really, to train cadres in a whole variety of spheres of governance and uh, management. They have to spend three months every two years in courses on, on social management and, and governance now. And it's commendable. In fact, China's model of meritocracy is commendable to the world. All countries can stand to learn from it, going to these public administration academies and party schools. You know, they have, you know how many party schools they have in China? 2,800. Wow. <laughs> then they have about 3,000 public administration academies. And then they have about 800 what they call socialism academies run by the uh, United Front Department. So they take governance at a local level very seriously. And they're very, good, they're, well, I would say they're very good at it. But if you look at, uh, and they are good at it, but if you look at public opinion polls in China, interesting. The central government gets very high ratings from the Chinese population. Local government get terrible ratings. Central government's 90% above satisfaction rate. Local governments are 20% below satisfaction rate. So uh, all this meritocratic training is good, and that includes, by the way, an ecological training. You're now, if you're a local official, your promotions are measured on a 14-point scale, which includes green indicators. Um, so you have, you can't just be a corrupt local politician and expect to stay in power in China. You have to kind of constantly reprove yourself. You're being examined constantly. Who would want to be a Chinese communist local official is beyond me. I, I wouldn't, but you're under the microscope of the party constantly. So yes, they have meritocracy. That's very Confucian, you might say. It's something I think other countries can really stand to learn from, including our own, maybe Brazil and others. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, um, the meritocracy is kind of compromised, I think, by the hegemony of the Leninist system. OK, very good. next uh, round. Yeah. Wait, how many? So very, very, very short questions. And this is the last round. Uh, oh, gosh. Starting <laughs> here. Is it OK for you if we I'll take them as all as together and you try to answer them? OK. okay. Obrigado. Um, you, you mentioned that, so you, you argue that we are now in a hard authoritarian cycle. And it started in 2009. That was well before Xi Jinping got in power. Yeah. So why? what happened in 2009? Is it related to the 2008 crisis? Second. There. And then 
here. I want to bring a question to our neck of the woods. Uh, one of our biggest uh, export uh, topics to China is uh, agricultural goods mm -hmm. and especially soybean. And uh, we represent uh, an association for all the agricultural biotechnology companies here in Brazil. And uh, we have a significant uh, uh, situation in China because of the uh, excess regulations and political interference. And so there is not a science-based system that allows the, the review of these products go through in China. Do you see any progress on that? Or how do you see the food security for these 400 new people that are going into urban areas? Who else? More, more. <laughs> hands are mushroomy in the. the so I, I, I have. Well, I have time restraints, so I, I'll have to be okay. selective. So you, you okay. go, Pedro, and then to the. F then you here, and then here, and then four more. You go first. Okay. Uh, well, mine is a quick question. Uh, uh, do you see any discussion uh, regarding, let's say, the uh, right now we have like a China and uh, Hong Kong with different currencies. If they are playing, let's say, a way of uh, converging the currencies, uh, if there is a uh, uh, something, let's say, there in the uh, in the blue uh, uh, print, let's say, for uh, uh, for that. Good. Good. Here. Thank you. My name is uh, Robert Wong. Uh, congratulations, Professor. Uh, it was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, you know that uh, trying to interpret a speech in, of a Chinese, especially a politician, is this exercise in frustration. <laughs> so you were able to get some stuff out of that speech of Xi Jinping. But my question is the following. You know that um, the anti-corruption pr uh, process in China is very serious. Mm. I was there recently, and the uh, governor of the state invited me for dinner very nice person, but very beautiful place, and I offered to pay. He wouldn't accept it. He said, I can't accept you paying. And second, you know, um, I have to pay my purse for my personal pocket. It is not government money. I was quite impressed. My point is the following. Uh -huh. We in Brazil are facing a terrible, terrible corruption situation. Hmm. How can we apply some of that things that China have done here? <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be incredible. We need that. <laughs> Okay, my question is about the future, uh, t uh, technological future. Uh, what do you think about the impact of this kind of new technology like uh, blockchain or uh, intelligence, um, artificial intelligence or um, so on? Mm. And uh, uh, in terms of China, and uh, what kind of uh, situation they could face in the future? Um, because of these new trends, the new new tech trends, what you, the the technology right. trends. Okay, how uh, uh, how China will be impacted by this? Uh, this could change the 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 way that China is going now. Okay, okay, okay. Particular last innovation and things like that. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, last question. Tom Dwyer, Unicamp. Uh, could you please comment on the effects of the what you playing as a crackdown for intellectual life and for cooperation, say, between Chinese intellectuals and people, just for example, in your university or in, in North America? Okay. Um, okay, and students abroad. Right. Um, well, all excellent questions. I'm not certain that I can... Uh, answer a couple of them. For example, soybeans and food security, not something I follow, I'm afraid. But I know that uh, soybeans are also a major American export to China, and I have heard, um, because I grew up on a farm in Illinois that exported soybeans to um, some of my friends who still live there say that they are encountering the same problem of, of the um, the soybeans and corn being left on the docks in uh, Chinese ports after they arrive. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, and they're just not getting, they rot because the bureaucracy won't process it um, in time. I don't know if that's, that's, so it's just an anecdotal. I've heard the same thing that you're experiencing, but I don't have any um, knowledge really beyond that. Convergence of Hong Kong dollar and ren renminbi, never heard of that before. I would doubt very much they would want to go down that path. Um, 
they may at some point just occur to me want to fix the rate of the Hong Kong dollar to the renminbi instead of to the US dollar, which it currently has always been. I could conceivably <laughs> envision that happening at some point, yet one more way to control Hong Kong. Um, let's see, the other three questions um, are more, comp more four, three questions are more complicated, <clears throat> four questions, sorry. So on the question of 2009 and the shift from soft to hard authoritarianism, um, I was actually living there that year, so I, kind of witnessed it and you could feel it and all Chinese, urban Chinese and kind of people I hung around with, intellectuals uh, were feeling it, NGOs were feeling it. And you're correct, it started before Xi Jinping became the, the general secretary and the president of the country. But he was the vice president and he was a member of the standing committee and he was the designated heir apparent. So he was certainly part of the decision-making process back in 2009 that made this conscious sh shift. Um, but there were several factors that uh, explain it, um, I think. One is the global financial crisis. You're quite correct to point to that. Because the Chinese uh, felt that um, after years and decades of predicting the decline of the West and the collapse of, of American hegemony, as they like to call it, it was finally happening and um, in, on Wall Street and more broadly. That coincided with their own belief of vindication of their economic model. The so-called China, they started talking a lot about the China model, the Zhongguo Moshe at that time. I was subjected to multiple lectures about the Zhongguo Moshe that year I lived in Beijing. Um, so that was a factor. Um, third factor is the 180,000 demonstrations every year that I noted on one of those slides. They were getting, there was a lot of <coughs> social unrest in the countryside um, and in medium-sized cities that was increasing. And I think they got nervous about that and that you know they needed to kind of get a grip on the public security situation. So a fourth factor is there was a man named Zhou Yong Kang who was also in the standing committee of the Politburo at that time. Zhou Yong Kang is now behind bars in jail, in prison for the rest of his life. He's one of the several so-called tigers, uh, high level officials who've been taken down in the anti-corruption campaign. Well, Zhou Yong Kang was in charge of the internal and state security systems. He was the Berea of China at that time. <laughs> and, um, so he uh, said, no problem, we'll be happy to crack down, just give us the resources. And so you can see, precisely in 2009-10, the internal security budget in, overtook the PLA's military budget for the first time, and it's continued to grow greater since then. So China is a country that has the world's second largest military budget, but it spends more money on internal security, roughly about 160 billion US dollars a year, than on external security. Think about that for a second. So money, so the point is resources. And certain bureaucracies, all bureaucracies love resources. You know, they, that's what they do for a living. That's what bureaucracies do for a living. Propag and so there's four bureaucracies in China that year that stood to benefit from a crackdown. The SOEs, um, the propaganda system, the internal security system, and the military. So m their money all went up, what I call the control bureaucracies. So those were factors. And um, oh, and then the retirement. Personalities have, have a, a role to play here. So the, the man in charge of the soft authoritarian opening over the previous decade was a um, man uh, who had to step down and retire in 2009 because he hit the age limit. Um, his name I'm blanking on at the moment. Um, he was Jiang Zemin's right-hand man, uh, it'll come to me. A uh, very important uh, leader, he was the number three leader in the Politburo, and he really is the one who was pushing for managed political opening from above. So you take him out of the picture, um, and uh, his name will come to me. <laughs> uh, you don't have a proponent for liberalization anymore. So, and you need one. If you're gonna have managed change from above, which is controversial anyway, you need a strong senior leader who's gonna uh, carry that through. And um, when he retired, uh, they didn't have such a leader. So a combination of factors, short 
answer to your question, it's a complicated question, a combination of factors came together that shifted from soft to hard authoritarianism in 2009-10. Okay, anti-corruption uh, in Brazil. I've been reading about it. <laughs> yes, you do have a problem here. Um, but you can remove your leaders, um, you know, through the judicial system uh, for the most senior leader, right? The president of your country, too. <laughs> you can't do that in China. Certain people are untouchable. Although the anti-corruption campaign has taken down, as I say, a number of tigers uh, at the political bureau level. I'll tell you a, a uh, story, a funny story. When I was, uh, I think, here about 10 years ago, or eight years ago, I, I flew from Sao Paulo to Brasilia, and I landed on the, at the airport in Brasilia, and parked way at the end of the tarmac was this massive Chinese 747 with the Chinese state flag on the tail. And of as you know, the airport in Brasilia doesn't take 747s normally. <laughs> it's smaller planes. And I saw this plane parked way down at the end of the tarmac, and I thought to myself, what's that all about? Is Jiang Zemin here secretly on a secret visit? You know, there was no, no Chinese leader visiting Brazil in the media that week at all. So I went to the Intermarati, and I asked them, well, who, who belongs to that airplane? You know, who do you have visiting from China? And they were kind of embarrassed that, you know, because this was not supposed to be known. So it was a man named He Guo Chang and a delegation. So what was He Guo Chang in charge of at that time? Uh, the organization department and, and anti-corruption work. This is about eight years ago. And he was here in Brazil to learn how Brazil controls <laughs> anti-corruption. <laughs> Seriously, he was on a global tour, and he had stopped here to learn what he could from the Brazil approach to anti-corruption. Whatever he learned, they've, they've done pretty well on. So that's a, that's a true story, but quite seriously, I mean, they, uh, I would make one observation about their anti-corruption campaign. They're dealing with the manifestations of corruption. They're not dealing with the causes of corruption. In other words, they're dealing with lifestyle manifestations. You know, who you went to dinner, and, you know, he couldn't, he had to pay himself. Did you have red wine? Probably can't have red wine. They have six, six dishes and three soups. So they're, they're going after people for bad lifestyles, having multiple villas, multiple mistresses, you know, gold in bars in the basement, cash. Um, you know, things you do when you have the ability to be corrupted. They are not at all dealing with the systemic sources of corruption. There's no asset declaration law in China. You know, that might help if officials had to declare their assets publicly. Um, uh, you know, or if the judiciary was independent of the party, or if the media was independent of the government and could actually do investigations and reporting on their own, or if rent seeking, you know what rent seeking is, right, was not, everybody, all cadres, that's how you make money in China in a corrupt fashion. You rake off a little percentage of whatever project it is for yourself and your colleagues and your family. That's rent seeking. So the bigger the project, the more the rent. So they're not dealing with the rent seeking issue because it's linked to this economic development strategy of, of uh, fixed asset investment and credit and money and pouring concrete, right? <laughs> if they shift their development model, to get, deal with the middle income trap, it will also help them deal with the anti-corruption problem. So I just don't think they're going at the causes, the systemic causes. It's not that these are bad people. Bad people emerge when the environment allows them to be corrupted. You do that in any country. But you know, other countries don't have corruption problems on that scale. A transparency would help. Uh, a lot of things would help. So, but Brazil no doubt can learn I don't know what you can learn from the way they've gone about it. This is, this is an inner, this is a series of secret investigations, punishments, disappearances. I'm not sure, a, a democracy, I'll put it this way, a democracy cannot police corruption in the way the Chinese have done it in the last five years. You just can't do it. You have laws against this kind of thing. Um, and it's a good thing we have laws. You know, so it may not be uh, an ideal in Brazil, but believe me, you have 
methods and you've had results that the Chinese have neither those methods and they don't have those results. So um, let's see, uh, artificial intelligence and new technology. Well, economically, I think I've already uh, answered it. You know, it's all part of the middle income trap. You have to go into these new technological areas and innovate in those areas if you're going to move up the value added chain. And they very clearly have identified those. Robotics is another one, by the way. But your question, I think you were getting at politics and what artificial intelligence, for example, can, can be used for political, for surveillance. So right now in China, I'm told, I mean, there are cameras everywhere. Maybe that's what Brazil can do in terms of artificial corruption, put cameras everywhere. And, and you'll find a lot of footage. But uh, they're now using facial recognition technology. Um, I was told by somebody last week who just come from Beijing, you can walk down the street and they, will, they can just pick out the whole crowd and do, identify everybody in the crowd instantly. So Orwell would recognize this phenomenon. Um, <laughs> You know, the new technology in the hands of totalitarian rulers is a pretty scary thing. And that's the way China's, that's one way China's going to be going. The internal security apparatus getting their hands on this new kind of technology is not necessarily a good subject. Which brings me to the last question about, well, I thought you were going to ask me about Chinese intellectuals in China. But then you ended your question talking about Chinese students in America. No, no, I didn't know. I mean, how about the interface at your level? professors and things like that. And certainly the question was about Chinese. You mean interface with Chinese in the United States or in China? In China, and then how does that affect cooperation? Well, another element of, of the repression in the last five years and the crackdown on civil society is a, um, I wouldn't call it a complete elimination, but a dramatic reduction in the exchanges that we have with Chinese universities, think tanks, and other NGOs because of the NGO law. So under the new NGO law in China, every exchange has to be approved. That means every foreigner on the delegation coming has to be approved. Every foreigner's paper topic has to be approved. Everything is controlled. Um, and many of these joint conferences are canceled. I've, I've, last month, I, you know, I have had four conferences in the last year I was supposed to participate in China canceled at the last minute. You know, a couple cases I'd already purchased airplane tickets. Had one canceled in September. Had, had an invitation today from one that I was invited to three weeks ago that I said I couldn't do it, but it turned out to be canceled anyway. Now they want to do it again. <laughs> so, you know, the, the pressure on the civil sphere in, in China is severe. And that affects their interactions with the outside world. And they've been dramatically reduced in the last five years. It's a very uh, concerning trend. I thought you were talking about Chinese students abroad. So if you're not aware of it, you should go home and Google China Australia and read what's been going on in Australia for the last six months with Chinese um, activities of various sorts, including uh, students in Australian universities criticizing their lecturers, um, criticizing other students who might speak up. This is a phenomenon we're beginning to experience in American universities now, too. The Chinese are always rather reticent to talk in class, but now they don't know who is a monitor. And so the Chinese security services are planting monitors in amongst students, amongst businessmen, amongst journalists, amongst everybody who goes abroad, there are security monitors. And who are they watching? They're watching each other. So, you know, people are aware of that, and that constrains their, what they say overseas. And this, and they've, in Australia, it's reached a severe level. The Australian foreign minister gave a big speech last week about the dangers to Australian society of this trend. Chinese businesses have been investing in Australian political parties. Um, for some reason, Australia doesn't have laws against foreign entities investing in parties. So what's been going on in Australia and New Zealand might be a harbinger of what is coming to the West. China is, in other words, China's exporting its censorship, trying to export its censorship, trying to export its controls abroad, um, and this whole internal 
model that I've been talking about tonight is beginning to go, go global, and that is a big concern. And it should be a concern to all democratic societies around the world. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you.